Lord. Please open to John chapter 4 this morning. John chapter 4 this morning. If you're on the back, you don't have to sit back there. It's okay. There's a whole row up here by Brother Andrew Amen. that you can move up to. And he'll share. But John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Uh, this morning in the Scripture. In just a minute, we'll read our, our opening of our text. And after we do that, then we're going to pray for God's help this morning. We're going to need it this morning because there's about 20 sermons, 20 good messages that really give us insight into uh, who Jesus was and why He came and give us insight into the heart of God and really the way God thinks, particularly about sinners. And uh, so this is one of those passages of Scripture I'm just telling you, it's just so loaded that almost sometimes I'm so excited about preaching it that it's almost like, man, you just it's it's more of a burden uh, because there's just so much that you don't want to miss. You want to make sure to cover it. I'm telling you, this passage of Scripture is loaded with so many doctrinal truths. That doesn't mean that if we don't get all the way where we want to go today, that <clears throat> that today we won't or we won't go back here next week. But uh, let's let's just read <clears throat> down to. Uh, verse 4 and chapter 4, and then we'll follow the storyline. Uh, and this passage actually in many ways reads much more like an Old Testament passage because it tells a story. It's almost like a historical account of this is what happened, but it also has direct teaching from it that gives application as well. So verse 1 of chapter 4, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus Himself baptized not, but His disciples. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh He to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now I meant to read through verse 4, but it won't do us any harm to have read through verse 5. Let's pray for God's help now, shall we? God, we do need Your help this morning. We need clarity. Lord, we need myself, my person, to be uh, very, very concise. And God, I pray in a very, very, um, very, very beyond the typical way that you would really allow the preacher this morning to diminish and for Jesus Christ to increase so that we would just see the heart of Jesus here and be left with an impression of who Jesus is and His heart toward the lost. And I pray that as well you would help us to get answers about truth. Like, God, how many people think that there are many roads to God or many ways to God? And I pray that you would help us to see how clear it is that you are the one who dictates the way that man comes to you. I pray we learn these things this morning by the help of your word and through the preaching of your servant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at how to have confidence, how to know confidently that we have eternal life. And you know, last week was Time Change Sunday, and that was a tough time to preach. I'm recovered from time change already. I woke up this morning at the time I... Well, I woke up at the time that would have been 5.30 last week, and 6.30, which is when I like to wake up on Sundays and felt good, and I'm alert and so forth here today. But I was not alert last week. Sunday morning. I was struggling uh, just being here last Sunday morning. Anytime they, the tyrannical time tamperers do their thing, it messes me up. But in spite of that, last week we prayed for God's help. And you know, I think that I couldn't tell you how many people last week told me, you know something? That message really helped me last week to know that I have eternal life and to know that I have assurance of salvation. And so if that's a message that was a help for you, Brother Tony made sure to put that just to post it on our church's Facebook page so you could find it there. And it would kind of lead into this week's message very, very naturally and be a help for you. Uh, this week is really the practical application of what Jesus preached to Nicodemus in John 3. In John 3, the, the Gospel writer, the Apostle John, is showing us through the words of Jesus Christ Himself, the historical encounter that He had with the Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus, just showing us that salvation is simply by faith in Jesus Christ. So last week we saw that from John chapter 3, very, very simply. And again, we know that the difference between the Gospel of John 
and the other Gospels is that John wrote his Gospel so that we could know how to be saved. In other words, he said in John chapter 20 and verse 30, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. So the other Gospels, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, show us who Jesus is. And Jesus is the Gospel. But Jesus being the Gospel, and you and I receiving Jesus, or being born again, or being saved. You could use those terms interchangeably. You could say, receiving Jesus, or you could say, being born again, or you could say, being saved, and all of those would be terms that refer to receiving Jesus, receiving the Gospel, or responding to the Gospel. So everything Jesus said and taught is Gospel. But getting saved is receiving Jesus. And that's John's perspective as he writes this Gospel. And so you'll see, John's Gospel is very different. The passage today, and when we're in John chapter 8, and we see the woman taken in adultery, are really passages that give us a perspective about Jesus Christ who saves sinners. Not that the other Gospels exclude that, but John is just letting us know the kind of people that Jesus saves. And today, can we put that? The, can we phrase it that way when we talk about the woman at the well and the people at Samaria? Can we use the phrase "kind of people," the kind of people that Jesus saves? Whenever you say "kind of people," all of a sudden you're kind of uh, you're kind of excluding a little bit, aren't you? Or you're kind of saying "them" or "those people." Uh, sometimes I. I uh, like to use phrases like that when I'm being silly. And I'll be talking about Luke and I'll be like, well, you know, those kind of people. People like Luke. You know, and sometimes when you use a phrase like that, you're talking about people that in your mind, I'm not really thinking this way. A little bit. A little bit. But in your mind, people that are not as good as you are. And truly, you're not as good as me at basketball. That's a fact. Or at arm wrestling. Or... Um, well, that's about the only two things that I'm better than you at. But uh, anyway, those kind of people. Well, listen, the truth of the matter is that John includes a lot of those people. In other words, the kind of people that the Pharisees and the elite religious class of the day would think that God wouldn't want anything to do with. And John's Gospel just keeps including those kind of people over and again. And, and, and by the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also make sure to let you know that Jesus ate with uh, publicans and sinners and He was criticized for uh, dealing with those kind of people. Let's just stop here and be real. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. We're all those kind of people, aren't we, when it comes to comparing ourselves with the Holy God? Yeah. And so I find a lot more to relate to God than the rich young ruler who said, I've kept all the laws mm -hmm. from my youth until now. I'm sorry, but I aren't one of those kind of people. I've never kept all the laws. I'm not the righteous kind of person. And by the way, that kind of righteousness is a self-righteousness. It's not an actual righteousness when you are in the presence of God. No person who has ever seen the, the holy presence of God has ever stood there and gazed. Any person who gets a glimpse or a view of who God actually is falls on their face and says like Isaiah did, Woe is me! I'm undone! I'm a man of unclean lips. And I'm not identified with the Holy God, but I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm those kind of people. That's us, isn't it? We are those kind of people. And so the Samaritans, the, the, the woman at the well specifically, but the people in Samaria are those kind of people. Uh, in other Gospels, we have the account, you remember the Good Samaritan? We had the account of the Good Samaritan. Remember the man was beaten, robbed, and left for dead on the side of the road? And when people passed by, you know, one of them, what, well, let's see, what was a, one was a Levite? Was it Charlie? One was a Levite and the other was a priest? Yeah. It was the, something like that. It was a Levite and a priest. And when they saw the guy beaten on the side of the road, like, oh, don't want to go there. Don't want to get involved with that. And they, they passed by, but the man from Samaria, he went by and 
he treated the man, he bound up his wounds, and uh, he took care of him, and then he took him to an inn, and he gave, uh, paid for a place for him to stay and told the keeper of the inn, you take care of him, and here's some money to do it. And if it, if it costs anything more than that, when I come back again, I'll pay for whatever it costs. You take care of this guy. And the Samaritan is contrasted with the people who were, quote, titled or entitled religious people. And so we have the story of the Good Samaritan. It's interesting that the Gospels kind of give us a perspective of Samaria that would have gone right in the face of what the religious people of the day would have thought. Factually, the Samaritan people were outcast in Israel in Jesus' day. Now, we know they're outcast for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're outcast because of the way they worship God, and it wasn't right, the way they worship God. In other words, they worshiped in a high place or they worshiped in a mountain instead of at the temple. Is God okay with that? No, we'll see that in our text if we get there today. But the second reason they were outcasts is because they'd intermarried with Gentiles and they, weren't, they didn't keep the Jewish laws. They weren't concerned with being pure as uh, people of God. And so they're kind of understandably outcasts, weren't they? In other words, what they were, they were wrong about, but that had nothing to do with whether or not God loved them and God wanted, them, well, God wanted to reach them. Most of us know the story of the, the woman at the well. But here we are, Jesus is passing through, and this phrase, the way the Bible puts it, is that he must needs go through Samaria. In other words, uh, from what I understand geographically, Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria, and most Jews didn't want to. But the text says Jesus must needs go through Samaria, and so the implication here is that Jesus wanted to go through Samaria. The idea was that even though... Uh, I'm really preaching to the gospel to Israel. Samaria is Israel, and I've got to go there. And so, as Jesus and his disciples are passing through uh, Samaria, and they're they're on the way to Galilee, the Bible says in verse six, "Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour." And I don't want to get too much into this discussion about Jacob's well. <laughs> Uh, but this is the only place that this particular location is mentioned. And a lot of people who don't believe the Bible say, well, Sychar means Shechem, not Sychar. And that means place of the drunk. Or, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't actually mean Sychar. It's Shechem. And that's where Jacob's well is. And the only reason they believe that is because they, don't, that they didn't have information that taught that or that, that, that uh, where they knew where Sychar was. But it turns out, that there's been a place on earth uh, by the name of Sychar, and, and it fits the description here of Jacob's well. And of course, the people at Jesus' day would have known that this was Jacob's well. The Samaritan woman said, you know, our father Jacob gave us this well, or he gave this well to Joseph. Uh, so uh, obviously, evidently, just because history doesn't have information that's in the Bible, be careful of studying commentaries where people say, well, the Bible doesn't mean what it says. The Bible always means what it says. Unless it says it doesn't mean what it says. When the Bible says this is like, or this is the same as, or this is similar to, then it, it is saying this is not the, the exact same, but it's like this. But when the Bible just states, excuse me, this is Sychar, uh, the well that Jacob uh, gave to his son, then that's exactly what it means. And just because we've lost some geographic information, which has now been recovered and we actually have, just believe the Bible. The Bible is always corroborated. It's always proven to be true. And friend, if you don't believe the Bible, that's a slippery slope. You always have to decide what you don't believe and how much you don't believe it. And you'll find out that there are other people that don't believe it to a greater extent. And when you try to uh, arrive at truth or discuss it with them, how much you don't believe the Bible is just such a relative thing because that's just a choice. I've chosen to believe what the Bible says about itself and that it's a perfect book and that God gave it and that's a preserved book and that you can rely on it 100%. Amen. And I found that to be a reliable position. In other words, it isn't just because of what I believe, but it's true. It's God's Word and everything in it is true and you can believe it. Okay, now based on that, then 
The Bible says in verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now before I describe this, let's just look at what the Bible says. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so she simply states what we described before, and that is that Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And she's surprised, evidently, by the way that Jesus is dressed, evidently, uh, it, uh, by, by the way that, that because He's a stranger in their city, evidently she knows not only is He not from there, but she knows He's Jewish. And her expectation is, oh great, I've got to draw water at the well and there's a Jew sitting on it that's going to hate me. You ever been somewhere where you knew people didn't want you to be there? Now you might be the kind of person that likes to go there just to aggravate them. But I don't like being places where people don't want me to be. Do you? That's not a comfortable place or comfortable thing. And so here is actually God's son. Now think on this being the Samaritan woman, will you? In other words, she's thinking, here's a Jew who thinks he's too good for me. Had she known this is the son of God who actually is too good for me. How much more of a contrast would that be? In other words, it's incredible, isn't it, when you think about how approachable Jesus was? It's incredible when you think that the Son of God could be approached by any person and they could say, hey, this is my need, and, and he'd say, of course. He'd say, can I speak to you? And he'd say, yeah, I'm going to come to your house today. I mean, that's the way Jesus was. It's incredible when the centurion came to Jesus and, and he said, you know, my daughter, she's sick, she's dying. And Jesus said, well, then I'll come and heal her. <laughs> Remember Zacchaeus? He's in a tree. And Jesus walked by and He said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go to your house today. It's incredible, my friend, how approachable the Son of God is. But I think that if the Samaritan woman had known this is not just a Jew, but this is God's Son, I think she'd have been afraid to even go to the well. Would you have been? I think I would have been. So she goes to the well. And while she's going there, she's probably trying to avoid eye contact. She's probably trying to avoid conversation. She's probably just wanting to get her water and get out of there. And the Jew says, could you draw water for me to drink, please? And she just says what's on her mind. I mean, this woman's been around and she's not afraid to say what she thinks. She said, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest water of me, being a Samaritan? The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You can't drink my water. You're too good for my water. And Jesus' response to her... She, oh, wait, 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 listen, listen to what, uh, oh yeah, Jesus, verse 10. Jesus answered, said her, if thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, let's analyze that statement. That's verse 10. Let's analyze that statement, gift of God. Is gift of God that phrase used anywhere else in the Scripture? I think of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, don't you? <laughs> For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so Jesus says to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said to you, if you knew that the person who could save you by faith, through, by grace through faith, if you knew who it was, you'd ask, and He'd give you living water. And uh, verse... 11, the woman, she's taking it very literally, just like Nicodemus did. Remember how Nicodemus took Jesus literally? Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? This woman's the same thing. She said, uh, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. You're going to dive in and throw water up? <laughs> you don't even have anything to draw with, and the well's deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Where are you going to get the living water? She asked him. And she goes on to be a little bit needling. Isn't it incredible that Jesus even takes this kind of treatment? She said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? And what's the answer to that question, knowing what you know? Yes. <laughs> yes, Jesus is greater than Jacob. 
Uh, what's Jacob mean? It's not Israel here. It's not Israel's well. Deceiver. Jacob means trickster, deceiver, liar. Are you greater than the liar which gave us this well? The one that stole his brother's birthright and tricked his uh, uncle Laban and that <laughs> you can go down the list of Jacob and you know the one that you know treated his sons Joseph and Benjamin better than his other ten sons because they weren't born to Rachel, they were born to Leah. Are you greater than that guy? And the answer is yes. And and, and she says in, in, in verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. And so now he's going to, just like he let <clears throat> Nicodemus know, I'm talking about spiritual things. He's going to let her know through his illustration that he's talking about spiritual things. And, and I can just see Jesus gesturing here as he's sitting at the well. And he's weary and he's tired, and I think it's kind of a weak gesture. Sort of like, well, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I give him shall never thirst. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm not talking about this kind of water. I'm talking about the kind of water that your soul is seeking. And my friend, lost and without Jesus, souls are seeking. Souls are thirsty. Souls are hungry. And my friend, Jesus is the living bread. And Jesus is the living water. And He's the one that can satisfy. This morning, Andrew sang, Like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. Boy, is that true. Man, you drink this water, and it's Jacob's well. I mean, this is, this is a special place. I'd like to go taste the water at Jacob's well, wouldn't you? That'd be a special experience for me, just to sit there and think about this conversation and to drink the water. But I'll be thirsty again when I drink Jacob's well's water. But any person who's drank of the water that Jesus gives shall never thirst, the Bible says. So that's a pretty good water right there. By the way, Jesus illustrates the answer to his statement uh, by himself. In verse 15, well, I, I need to read the rest of the part because she says, Jesus said, the water that I give him, shall give him, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus said, I'm talking about everlasting life. That's the kind of water I'm talking about. I'm talking about everlasting life. How would you like some of that, lady? Give me some of this water and I'll give you everlasting life. Well, that's not an even trade. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. <laughs> and she's still taking it pretty literally, isn't she? <laughs> give me some of the water. She said, I'll never come back here. I won't have to do this again. Jesus isn't saying that. Jesus saith unto her. Now he's going to get right into the crux of the reason she needs the everlasting water. She said, Go, call thy husband and come hither. She said, Go get your husband and bring him here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that thou saidst truly. Jesus said, Well, you sort of told the truth that you don't have a husband. you got five. Five of them. Five people you promised God till death do us part. Five husbands. Now let me ask you a question. In Samaria, how would a woman with five living husbands be viewed? Probably not. What's that? Well, probably I'm not telling you, in a terrible, in a, in a godless society, a person who marries and and uh, assuming she divorced her husband's whatever, you know, she, I don't know what Samaritan law was. But marriage is always a vow between a God and two people, right? So she made a vow to God with five people. And now she's not even bothering to vow, she's just living with a guy that isn't one of the five she promised. How would they have viewed her in Samaria? John R. Rice called them Hollywood whores. <laughs> okay. Well, that's John R. Rice's uh, that's John R. Rice's statement. I don't have I don't have words. Right? I'm not one to, to use words to describe sinners. So I use the words that Jesus uses. But I don't really have words, but I can tell you this. This woman would have been looked down on by a people who were looked down upon. 
That's my point. In other words, the Samaritans would have looked down on this woman and the Jews would have looked down on the Samaritans. And right away, Jesus is just exposing her. More than that, He's letting her know, I know everything about you. And my friend, if you think that just because God knows everything about you, then that must mean that He concludes what people would conclude about you. Can I say God's better than people, but He doesn't do that? Jesus' conclusion is, I know everything about you. And I can give you living water. I hope you see the heart of God here a little bit. Do you see the heart of God? My friend, aren't you glad that God, when He loves, doesn't love like a person loves? And that the only people who truly love, love like God does? This is incredible. The fact that Jesus must needs go through Samaria because it's to meet this woman. And it's to meet the city of people that are looked down on and that are considered to be not worth loving. And Jesus says... It says to her, yeah, you had five husbands. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. And now she's going to change the subject. Let's don't talk about my five husbands anymore. <laughs> she says, I perceive thou art a prophet. I've never met you before and you know things about me. And so you must be the kind of person that knows things supernaturally. You know, that's sort of what Nicodemus said when he came to Jesus, isn't it? I know that our teacher come from God. She says, you know, there's something... There's something spiritual, something prophetic about you. The implication here is that God's telling you things or you know things from God. Well, Jesus was more than a prophet. But she's going to try to have a religious discussion. A lot of times when people don't want to talk about themselves or their need for Jesus, they try to have a religious discussion. And that's the diversion. And so she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now she says, ye say, she's lumping him in with the Jews. The Jews believed, what were the problems the Jews had with the Samaritans? Where they worshipped, right? In other words, if God is in the temple and if God prescribed temple worship, didn't He? Were they right about that? They were right about that. If God prescribes temple worship and you think you can just go to the mountain and worship, you're not worshipping right and you're not as good as us because we are worshipping right. She said, did you say you've got to worship in Jerusalem at the temple? But we worship in this mountain. And you know, as she says we worship in this mountain, I kind of see a mountain. Now, I see a rocky mountain. That's probably not the kind of mountain uh, that, that, uh, we, that, that Jesus is here seeing. I need to go here sometime so I can see the mountain that she's talking about. But a mountain, of course, would be a high place, a, a high perspective. And, and I'll be honest with you, high places are spiritual places for me. I just can't be on a mountaintop and not just think about God. It's something about elevation, I guess, <laughs> that in a very, you know, from God's perspective is nothing, but for me, you know, gets me closer to God. I just, mountains, it might be because when I was a teenager, it could just be this way for me, when I was a teenager, I went to camp every summer, and really went there knowing that God was going to deal with me and anticipating that. We went to camp and God just really dealt with me. And the camp was in the Rocky Mountains. And it was just high places. And so we'd get out on our, on our own and just be seeing the picturesque beauty of God in the mornings and doing devotions and God dealing with me. So, so high places, <laughs> don't take this the wrong way, but high places are spiritual places to me. And I can just see this woman just describing this mountain which God made, and even after the flood, is so picturesque and so beautiful that I just don't see anything that man could make as far as a building or a temple rivaling it. Could you? You ever been like to Bridal Falls in Yosemite or uh, see uh, some of the, the uh, sites in Yellowstone or just be on the Pacific Coast Highway in Washington or California or just go out on the, uh, on the beach here uh, at, at night or in the early morning and watch the sunrise here in, uh, in Florida or just here been to these places and just been like, wow, man, God's creation is beautiful. Well, that's the way I feel about it. And so what this woman is saying is, you know, we don't think you just... You, God's not limited 
to a box in Jerusalem. You could worship God here. And truly, isn't that a pretty good argument? No, it's not. <laughs> gotcha! All right. No, it's not a good argument because Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the time is coming when it's not going to be the mountain, it's not going to be Jerusalem. But He said, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall... Or I'm sorry, verse 22. I, I said it wrong. I, okay. So He said, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus said, Believe me, the time's coming when this mountain or Jerusalem aren't going to be how or where you worship God. You won't have to go to a place to worship God. But He said, Right now, you're worshiping you don't know what. Salvations of the Jews. In other words, where did God say to worship Him at? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where God said to worship. And if God said to worship at Jerusalem and you worship in the mountain instead, what are you worshiping, God? Well, not how He said. You know, it's incredible today that worship is defined on the basis of the experience people have instead of looking at what God's Word defines worship as. I found our study last summer on worship to be really helpful, didn't you? Because most of the time when people talk about worship, they're talking about praise and about the ways that people praise God. But in every instance that the word worship is used in the different words that are used for worship, in the Scripture it means to fall on your face or to bow. It's never singing. It's never speaking. It's falling on your face before God. That's worship. And it's interesting that today that Christians have redefined worship. And the arguments, you can read the books where individuals are arguing for their worship, their style of worship. And the arguments for their style of worship are experience-based. This is how I feel. This is why I do what I do. Friend, can you feel, can you understand why the Samaritans worshipped at the mountain? First of all, going to Jerusalem was not convenient. Secondly, going to Jerusalem was something that they probably would have felt ostracized from even doing. Okay, we want to worship your way. Well, we're going to go to Jerusalem and worship your Samaritan. Don't come here. Can you understand why they worshipped the way they worshipped? The answer is, humanly speaking, I can. But you know what the problem with it all is? You can do whatever you want to, but it isn't what God said you do. And if it isn't what God said to do, you can't tell God you've done what He wants. We, on, on Sunday nights, we're, in, we're studying the transition between the judges and the kings. And we just saw, we've just seen Saul and his rebellion against God, where God told Saul, wipe out all the Amalekites and destroy everything. Don't keep anything from the Amalekites. And Saul kept the best of the sheep and the oxen, and he brought back King Agag. And when Samuel came, Saul said, Blessed art thou the Lord, I've done everything that, that God told me to do. And he said, well, what's the bleeding of this sheep and oxen? What, what is this? What means this? And he says, oh yeah, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. The, the people kept that. And he had all these reasons, all these excuses why he did what he did instead of what God said. But God said, hath the Lord, what is it, uh, d the God doesn't delight as much in the sacrifice of blood of, of, blood of uh, sheep and rams as he does in obedience. He talked about Saul's rebellion. He said, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. My friend, any worship that is not what God says worship is, is rebellion. Any worship that God, is not what God says it is, in God's mind is witchcraft. I just want to park here just for a second if it's okay with you if you'll permit me I'm not picking at anybody I'm not thinking of anybody here I want to park here for a second because I want us to be thinking people how popular today is new age it's very popular today have you noticed it's got a new presentation of itself it's it's uh, happy people it's spiritual people and people get together to do Zen or to, to do uh, yoga or I'm not saying that the well I'm kind of am 
but I'm not saying that the practice of yoga, but it is a spiritual thing for most people. There's a physical aspect, there's a spiritual aspect of it. And for many people, it's very, very spiritual. And, uh, you know, the uh, Eastern mysticism, um, as well as Wiccan, you know what all that is? It's all witchcraft. It is. And how do people feel when they do those things? Well, they feel very connected spiritually, don't they? I just, I, I, you know, it's got to be good because I just feel so good when I do it. You know, God doesn't really buy that argument. And He probably doesn't buy it any more in the church than He does in Wiccan or in New Age or in, in um, Confucianism or whatever. The religion is that isn't Jesus being the way to God. The reality of it is, is that you'd say, well, Pastor, there's a lot of wisdom there. There's a lot of... Listen, there's always good points, humanly speaking. The problem with it all is that God rejects it thoroughly. And we as believers need to be circumspect, very, very careful in what we tell God is His opinion about things. More often, we define how we worship God on the basis of how we desire to worship God than we do on what His Word says. And Jesus, it's interesting because He's very, very kind to this woman about everything, isn't He actually? I mean, He's direct. You've got five husbands. The guy you have isn't your husband. That's pretty direct. She changes the, the subject. And he's, he's a Jew that's speaking to a Samaritan, so He's, he's very, very, in a, in a good way, condescending. Condescending isn't a bad thing. It means that somebody comes from a high place to a low place. And Jesus is really coming to her level. In a very kind way. Just like a, an adult who would condescend to a child would get on his knees to speak face to face with the child. Jesus is speaking face to face with the sinner. You see what I mean by it's not a bad word the way we're using the word condescending here. And so now Jesus goes on to say, and we'll be finished here momentarily. In verse 22, you worship, ye know not what. Lady, you don't know what you're worshiping. You're worshiping all right, but you don't know what it is you're worshiping because it isn't God. That's pretty direct. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And then verse 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Well, in spirit we're worshiping God, but in truth you're not, so it's no good. Small s spirit. Spirit of man, you see. So, in spirit and in truth. So, you're in verse 24, do you notice the difference? God is a, what is that spirit? Capital S, right? Spirit of God. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit of man, small s, and truth. And so, you see the difference. You may be spiritual, small s, because God made us as spiritual beings because we have a spirit in us. But just because something is spiritual does not mean that it's God's Spirit. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're worshiping true. I'll give you that. But it isn't God that you're worshiping, so what good is it? And the answer to that is not at all. God is a Spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And my friend, no worship pleases God unless it is described in both ways. No worship pleases God unless it's with small s spirit. You know, the Jews of Jerusalem are uh, barging into the temple and saying, you know, God, I thank you that I'm not like this publican and a sinner. And God, I thank you that I'm such a good person that I've fasted twice a week and I give my alms and I pray and I thank you. I've, You know, everybody here knows me because I'm always here. And God, I thank you that I'm so good Versus the publican who beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to be a sinner. Well, both of them are spirit, but not really. The first guy's not worshiping. Worshiping is bowing to God. first guy's not bowing to God. He's puffing his chest up and boasting to men. The second guy is worshiping. You can go to the temple and worship and not worship in spirit. You see, right place, wrong spirit. You can go to the mountain and you can worship with the right spirit, but you're in the wrong place. 
Pastor, don't you think I could worship? Yeah, you could have the right spirit in the wrong place. And God says, I don't accept the right spirit in the wrong place. God's very specific, isn't He? God's very specific about how we come to Him. It's through Jesus and only Jesus. We're going to see later on in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, speaking of Thomas, uh, uh, or, uh, I was say, say, Philip, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, it's got to be the right place, the right person. It's got to be only Jesus. So let's, let's conclude this morning. We've gotten as far as we can uh, with the time that we have. The woman goes on to say, I know that Messiah is cometh. I'm in verse 25, which is called Christ. When He's come, He'll tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. She said, well, you know, I, I'm looking forward to when Messiah comes and I can get all these answers. And Jesus said, well, it's your lucky day. Here I am. And Frank, can I say to you, he's saying the same thing to you now. You know, Pastor, someday, you know, I'm going to get it all figured out. It's your lucky day. It's your lucky day. Because, friend, that's precisely what Jesus wants and He's here. And He'll meet with you. Isn't that wonderful? See, Jesus told Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life, or eternal life. And that's if that's you and you're here today, it's your lucky day. You want to know that Jesus is your Savior, my friend? Look to the cross of Jesus Christ and believe. And you'll have everlasting life. You can't look to anything else. You can't, you can't say, Pastor, I've got a religious background. It's a really good one. Well, it may be a really good one. And Jesus says, small s, a wrong location. But if you look to Jesus, my friend, it's the right place right person and to have you in the right place. The cross is the right place to worship. The cross is. That's where we come. And we bow ourselves down and we just look to Jesus and where God says, Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's just that simple. We're going to see next week not only the woman at Samaria but the whole village of the Samaritans met Jesus there at the well because it was the right person in the right place. Some of the things we've seen today is we've seen the heart of God. See, God, my friend, <laughs> He's better than us, but He reaches out to people that we think we're better than. Sometimes we don't think we're good enough. Can I tell you? God loves you. He loved the woman at Samaria. You just say, Pastor, I'm worse than her. You might be. But you know, <laughs> the way she's described here, Jesus only tells, her one, tells us one thing about her. But she's not known as a good person. Being known as a good person isn't what God's looking for. I've met people before that say, you know, I love the idea of being a believer, a Christian. And I want to be saved... But you know, I need to take care of some things in my life first because I just wouldn't feel right coming to God the way that I am. <clears throat> Friend, this woman was living with a man that wasn't her husband. She'd had five husbands. And you know, she came to God that day, not by accident, but in her mind, it was totally by chance. Did Jesus reject her? No, He did not. He received her. Why did He receive her? Well, because she received Him as He was. The right way. Spirit and truth. Jesus is who God says He is. He isn't anybody else. I want to finish, but I want to give you this illustration. I remember when I was in college and I was having a discussion with a guy that was into charismatic theology. And I was trying to show him from the Bible what I believed. And he kept telling me what he believed. And I realized after a while, you know, what I believe is what the Bible says and what he believes is what he's experienced. And he illustrated it for me this way. He said, God is like an elephant. 
I thought when he said that, you know, we probably better stop because God's not like an elephant. But he said God's like an elephant. This is how he described it. He said, you know, it's an experience. It's how you've experienced God who He is. He said, you know, one person, if a bunch of blind people are all around an elephant, an elephant's really big. And so one guy could be in the front of the elephant and have a hold of the tusk, and he'd be feeling the tusk, and he'd describe the way the tusk of the elephant felt, and that's who God would be to him. Another guy has a hold of the trunk, and he's feeling the trunk. Another guy's got a toe, another guy's got a tail. You know, and everybody, if they describe what they feel about God, it's different. And I thought about that and said, wow, that really illustrates something big like an elephant really well. I mean, one guy feels you know, a smooth ivory of a tusk. Another guy feels the pliable flexibility of the muscle of the trunk. And another person feels the toenail. Another person feels the tail or whatever. And they all have a different feeling. But you know, there's one problem with that whole illustration. God's not an elephant. <laughs> That's the problem. An elephant's big, God's big, but God's not an elephant. And how I feel about God isn't who He is. You know, if you're unsaved and you're under the guilt of your sin, God's wrath feels like He's a terrible person to you. But you're wrong about that. Because God loves you and He judged His Son in your place. God's love to you, but you feel like He is angry with you. How you feel is wrong. Your feelings can be wrong. And so when we worship God, we don't go based on how we feel. You know, when people worship, they oftentimes worship, and I keep going on, I need to stop, but oftentimes when we worship God, we worship Him based on how we feel. You know, when I'm at a ball game, and they say, everybody, let's stand up, and we're going to sing the national anthem. I'll tell you something, our national anthem means something to me. I stand up, I put my hand over my heart, and when I sing... My hair stands up on my arms and it raises up on the back of my neck and I thrill at being part of a nation of liberty under God. I mean, I just I get a real feeling when I sing the national anthem. I'm not worshiping God though. You say, Pastor, I'm telling you, when when we worship, when I worship this way, I just feel well, you have the feeling. I'm not saying your feeling doesn't exist. What I'm saying is that doesn't mean it's worship of God. Oftentimes people believe, well, this is the way I feel when I worship. And so this is what worship of God is, Fred. Worship of God is spirit and truth. How are you coming to God? What's your attitude? God, I want to go to your word. I want to find out who you are. And I want to find out where salvation is of. And I'll come to you your way. Or is it, God, I'm going to come to you. And this is how I'm going to do it because this is what I feel. That's different, isn't it? It's a different perspective. God, I pray that you would just help us with the truths that we've learned today. God, we saw the heart of our Savior Jesus is that, God, You love the unlovely. You love individuals that know that they're not worthy. And yet Jesus came to die for them and, God, You desire the unworthy. Us, we who would be those people who are unworthy, You love. God, we realize as well, though, that even though you love everybody, you don't accept everything from everybody. We never find you accepting this woman's lifestyle. We never find you accepting this people's worship. And yet, God, they were able to accept you. God, I pray that you'd help us to look at it that way. It is we who must accept you as who you are and not you who must accept us as we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think the message is pretty clear this morning from the Word of God. And we look forward to next week really finishing out this passage of Scripture and seeing uh, one of the most helpful truths that I've learned, and that's about the sustenance of serving Jesus. How to not burn out. You ever wonder how not to burn out serving God? You might need that message next Sunday, so you be here for it. Okay, you're dismissed. God bless you.